Brickyard 44, 67, wind 200 at 10, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear for takeoff. For most of our history, developments toward the dream of human flight were few and far between. Around 1000 BCE, the Chinese invented the kite, which demonstrated that a person, in the presence of wind, can keep an object aloft for an extended period of time. The next confirmed development doesn't occur for almost 2500 years. Between 1485 and 1500 AD, Leonardo da Vinci designed a flying machine and a parachute. Neither of these designs were put to the test during da Vinci's lifetime or in the centuries that followed. His parachute design, however, was tested and proven to work by Adrian Nicholas in the year 2000. In 1738, Daniel Bernoulli inadvertently made perhaps the most significant contribution to flight yet when he published his book, Hydrodynamica, which contained what would become known as Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle explained the relationship between the speed of a fluid and its subsequent pressure or density. This would lead to the understanding of lift, which is what allows an airplane wing to counteract gravity. 45 years later, in 1783, Two Frenchmen lift off from a park on the outskirts of Paris in a Montgolfier hot air balloon. Two years later, in 1785, Jean-Pierre Blanchard crossed the English Channel in a hot air balloon. Twelve years later, André Jacques Garnerin becomes the first person in history to attempt gliding to Earth with a parachute. Unlike the parachute designed by Leonardo da Vinci, Garnerin's apparatus was frameless and made of silk. Garnerin rode in a basket attached to the parachute by a long pole. After dropping from a hot air balloon, Garnerin glided to Earth, safely landing near Paris. Without speculating on the reasons, it is clear that interest in human flight is increasing dramatically by the end of the 18th century. This trend continues into the 19th century with a series of developments that would maintain the trend of rapid upward mobility. George Cayley, who is often considered to be the father of human flight, had been building prototypes of flying machines and studying what would become the principles of flight. He learned more about lift, stability, and propulsion, and designed corresponding elements such as dihedral and a tail to complement a glider's kite-shaped wing. In 1809, Cayley published a treatise on aerial navigation, which proclaimed that lift, propulsion, and control were the three requisites of human flight. This conclusion is remarkably similar to what we currently know as the four forces of flight, which are lift, thrust, drag, and weight. In 1852, French engineer Henry Gifford built the first powered airship. Although it is still lifted off the ground by means of hydrogen, the craft was propelled by a three-bladed propeller powered by a three-horsepower steam engine. On its first flight, Gifford's machine only traveled at six miles per hour and could not overcome the prevailing winds to move in a different direction. Nonetheless, it was called a dirigible, a term derived from a French word meaning to direct or steer. In other words, unlike a hot air balloon, which is entirely subject to the wind, this machine demonstrated that a lighter-than-air machine could be controlled, if only in exceptionally calm conditions. In 1891, Otto Lilienthal successfully began his famed gliding career. Lilienthal was killed in a glider crash in 1896, but luckily for humanity, Wilbur and Orville Wright were alive in Dayton, Ohio, ready to take the reins of flight. Before we get further into this video, I want to remind you to hit the subscribe button. If you're interested in transportation, history, or both, you'll want to know when a new video is posted. If you have something to say, make sure you leave a comment below. Okay, back to the video. There is little evidence that either of the Wright brothers knew much of anything about flight prior to 1896. While struck with typhoid and bedridden, Orville Wright read up on Otto Lilienthal's progress and observations and learned that Lilienthal believed the secrets of light to be exuded by the physique and behavior of birds. Wilbur and Orville began small experiments and observations to familiarize themselves with flight in the same way that many of their predecessors likely did. By watching birds, the brothers realized that small adjustments of the wing, not movements of the entire wing, gave birds a mastery of their own movement through the air. So, the brothers constructed a kite. Kites had been around for a few thousand years, but this one was different. It was made of bamboo, and its surfaces could be manipulated and warped from the ground via cords. Wilbur ultimately crashed this kite when he was experimenting with different maneuvers. The the destruction of the kite is an early indicator of what the Wrights would soon come to articulate, that human flight is difficult and will likely require operators with both knowledge and great skill. 
The Wrights knew they needed wind to conduct meaningful flight experiments, but the wind in Dayton, Ohio does not always blow. If they had a means of reliable wind, they could reliably conduct experiments without being interrupted by improper conditions. So, the Wrights reached out to the United States Weather Bureau for information. They figured that the ideal location would be a place where the prevailing wind was a steady 15 miles per hour, and where the climate was dry and the train soft for landing a glider. The Weather Bureau came through and sent the brothers records of prevailing winds for the entire United States. With careful consideration, it was clear that the best site for flight experiments would be Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The Wright brothers got to work on a full-size glider ahead of their departure in September 1900. When September came, the brothers temporarily left their bicycle shop in Dayton behind. The journey was long. Wilbur, who left before Orville, had to cross the Albemarle Sound in a leaking schooner during a storm. The journey took two days. What Wilbur did not know was that in 50 years, regular people would be crossing oceans in a few hours aboard jetliners. The brothers met some of the locals and set up camp near Kill Devil Hills, south of Kitty Hawk. Once the glider was reconstructed, they began testing its flight characteristics by flying it as a huge kite. Then, Wilbur Wright got onto the glider, lying prone as would be the case until many prototypes later, and was launched into the air. This was inherently dangerous, and certainly nerve-wracking for both the brothers who showed few signs of fear, but must have known the risks because of the precautions we know they took. Wilbur found that the glider was too difficult to control, even with the warping mechanisms they had designed. A gust of wind, for example, might send the glider out of control because its operator was not savvy in the arena of flight. Wilbur knew at once that the roadblocks he would face were both design-based and skill-based. Wilbur and Orville spent a month and a half at their Kitty Hawk camp, not leaving until the end of October, when they packed up their flying machine and headed back to Dayton. Wilbur had flown an untold number of times, but the longest glide was 400 feet. Their machine needed better controls and surfaces that would generate more lift. Wilbur would also need to get much better at flying. Still, they had flown, and as they were headed back to Dayton, they knew they would be returning to Kitty Hawk soon. Less than a year later, in July 1901, the Wright brothers returned to Kitty Hawk with a slightly modified version of their previous glider. The glider continued to be hard to control and continually rose too much. They had overcorrected for the lacking lift in the previous version. The problem was simple, too much camber. Simply put, camber is the curvature of the top of the wing or other airfoil. The more curvature, the more lift, due to Bernoulli's principle. But the brothers had used the exact 1 to 12 ratio suggested by Lilienthal in his calculations. Since Lilienthal's suggestion proved to be a guess, Wilbur and Orville knew they would be on their own and starting from scratch moving forward. They reduced the camber over the next several days to a ratio of 1 to 22. Then, Wilbur took to the air once more. The lift problem was corrected. The glider was responsive to rudder inputs. But... The wing warping system was not working as expected, and the glider was thus difficult and sometimes impossible to control. Some progress had been made, but nothing that couldn't have been solved in Dayton. The 1901 trip was cut short, and the return to Ohio in August, feeling discouraged. Back home, Wilbur was asked by fellow aviation pioneer Octave Chanute to speak at the Western Society of Engineers in Chicago. Wilbur hesitantly accepted at the urging of his sister Catherine. In a telling example of how he felt about his aviation experience so far, he titled his lecture, Some Aeronautical Experiments. He casually mentioned that Lilienthal's calculations, which were well known among aviation pioneers at the time, might be, quote, somewhat in error. The lecture was well received by many in attendance, but public opinion of aviation was still mixed at best, with some of the most well-respected and knowledgeable people in the world dismissing it as a foolish daydream. Wilbur and Orville created a primitive wind tunnel powered by a gasoline engine. For the rest of 1901, the pair exhaustively tested different airfoils and controls with the aid of their wind tunnel. This was the most scientific study of airflows and airfoils conducted to date. By August 1902, the brothers returned to Kitty Hawk with a third version of their flying machine. By then, their accommodations at Kill Devil Hills was beginning to look more like a permanent residence than a camp. Glider number three was also used as a kite before either of the brothers attempted to fly it. It was by far the world's largest glider at the time. Satisfied with his performance as a kite, Orville mounted the glider and flew for the first time. Unfortunately, his experience was understandably lacking, and he crashed, but escaped with no injuries. All things considered, the Wrights were exceptionally lucky in this regard throughout most of their time as aviation pioneers. The brothers went into a familiar state of repair work. Orville, hopped up on coffee, came up with the idea of putting the rudder on a hinge rather than having a fixed rudder. Wilbur didn't need any convincing to agree to his brother's innovation. After all, this design is much more like the rudders used on airplanes today. While all this was going on, Samuel Langley, who was head of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., 
was working on a flying machine with taxpayer funds. This machine was called the Aerodrome and was powered by steam. Langley requested a visit with the Wright brothers, but the Wrights declined. This is understandable since Langley himself was keeping details of his flying machine a secret. Wilbur and Orville stayed in Kitty Hawk until October of 1902, conducting over 1,000 glides. By the time they left, they had glided up to 600 feet and solved the last of their control problems. They could feel good about the work they had done on their journey back to Ohio. All they needed now was a way to power the flying machine. Thankfully, the Wrights were alive and conducting their experiments in the Wright era. The Wrights had a local man named Charlie Taylor in charge of their bicycle shop while they were away, and it just so happened that Taylor was an excellent mechanic. Together with Taylor, Wilbur and Orville built a 150-pound, four-cylinder, gasoline-powered engine. It produced 12 horsepower, four more than they expected eight horsepower, and contained an aluminum engine block, which contributed to its low weight. The issue of the power source was solved, but the bigger problem was the propeller. It had been assumed that the propeller design could be derived from the screw propeller used on ships. Surprisingly though, there was little known about the screw propeller and how it worked. Not to mention, air is a much different medium than water. The brothers knew they had to test the propeller on an actual flying machine in order to fully understand it. The flyer, as their fourth flying machine would be called, would carry two propellers mounted between the upper and lower wings. They would spin in opposite directions to counteract each other's gyroscopic action. The propellers would be two-bladed and have an eight-foot diameter. The Wright brothers and the flyer went back to Kitty Hawk. They knew their next flight would be the first powered flight of a heavier-than-air aircraft in history. On the first attempt, the engine misfired and self-destructed, causing some damage to the flyer in the process. While repairs were being done and the brothers were awaiting a new engine from Charlie Taylor, Samuel Langley of the Smithsonian carried out the long-awaited flight of the publicly funded Aerodrome. The event was a catastrophic failure, sending nearly $70,000 of public money and Charles Manley, the operator, into the frigid Potomac River. Thankfully, Manley escaped the ice-covered waters with his life. Meanwhile, the Wrights at Kitty Hawk had fixed the flyer and constructed a 60-foot track to guide the flyer during takeoff. On December 17, 1903, Wilbur Wright took the controls of the flyer, cruised down the track, gained enough speed to get airborne, and lifted off. For the next 12 seconds, history was made. Then, Wilbur overcorrected with the rudder, causing the flyer to crash after flying about 100 feet. The brothers were ecstatic. The first powered flight might not seem like much, but think about the first time you rode a bike after your mother or father let go unexpectedly. You likely crashed within yards. Now, add a third dimension of movement and largely misunderstood physics concepts, and it becomes easier to understand the significance of this event. The flyer flew several more times that day, despite the freezing cold and stiff winds. Ultimately, the longest of these flights would be 852 feet, a marked improvement over the first. As Wilbur said earlier that year, the bird's wings are undoubtedly very well designed indeed, but it is not any extraordinary efficiency that strikes with astonishment, but rather the marvelous skill with which they are used. Despite the historical milestone which had been passed, the world was still misinformed and misguided in their understanding of flight. Some newspapers made claims overstating the achievement of the Wright brothers by ridiculous margins. Others hardly gave them the time of day. Nobody seemed to know for sure what was going on, except for the Wright brothers. They knew exactly what they had done, and that they needed to focus all of their attention on raising aviation out of its infancy. They relocated their testing area to Huffman Prairie in Ohio. This way, they could continue to work while they sustained themselves and the project with the revenue from their bicycle shop. Since there was less wind on the prairie than in Kitty Hawk, the flyer had trouble taking off. To compensate for this, the brothers designed a gravity-powered catapult system which worked perfectly. Throughout 1904, the brothers conducted 105 successful flights of the Flyer II from Huffman Prairie. They performed flight in straight lines, S-turns, and circles, and reliably landed safely. During the winter of 1904 and 1905, work began on a more perfect flying machine, predictably called the Flyer III. This machine would be the flying machine that proved to the world that flying machines were real and that they could be put to practical use. Improvements for the Flyer III included a more powerful 25 horsepower engine, slightly reduced wing area, improved efficiency of the leading edges of the wings, and a rudder that has been moved forward to improve longitudinal control. The Flyer III was completed in June 1905. Wilbur Wright took to the sky and covered a distance of six miles in one flight. He demonstrated his improved skill as a pilot when he recovered from a stall by pushing the nose down to gain speed and re-establish airflow over the wings. By the summer and fall of 1905, the Wrights, including Orville, 
were routinely conducting flights of 12 to 15 minutes and were simply enjoying their newfound superpower and learning in the process. By now, the Wright brothers had a machine with a future and they knew it. They decided to bring the Flyer 3 to market. Wilbur and Orville were immediately contacted by Arnold Fortis, a representative of a wealthy French syndicate which wanted to purchase the Wright flying machine on behalf of the French government. Pending demonstrations of the flying machine, they were prepared to offer $200,000 for a single Flyer 3. The Wright brothers had an opportunity to become rich. After partnering with a New York marketing firm called Flint & Company, Wilbur was off to Europe to prove the Flyer 3's worth. France was enthralled by aviation, so Wilbur was exposed to other methods of flight such as hot air balloons and dirigibles. Dirigibles were slow and impractical, and having the opportunity to ride in a hot air balloon himself, Wilbur experienced their passive and vulnerable nature when he had to take a train on the return leg of their journey. Wilbur knew his flying machine was the way of the future. On August 8, 1908, Wilbur demonstrated the Flyer 3 to huge crowds of elated spectators in Le Mans, France. For the duration of his time in Europe, Wilbur continually performed elaborate maneuvers and flew vast distances for the unending hordes of people coming to witness history in the making. Aristocrats, royals, and public figures were just as impressed as anyone, and many had the opportunity to go aloft with Wilbur and his flying machine. Upon witnessing the spectacle for himself, French aviator Leon Delagrange declared himself beaten. Orville and Catherine had joined Wilbur in Europe to experience the events. When the three Wrights returned to America, their ship was welcomed to New York by harbor whistles and crowds who surrounded the ship at the pier. Back in Dayton, cannons and factory whistles sounded as their train arrived and soon after a parade lavishly celebrated the achievements of their local heroes. President William Taft discreetly received the Wright brothers at the White House and presented them with multiple medals. On July 27, 1909, at Fort Myer, Orville Wright took off with Lieutenant Frank Lamb in front of President Taft and 8,000 other onlookers. After landing, he learned that he had secured a $30,000 contract with the U.S. War Department. But it was not all about the money. The Wright brothers, especially Wilbur, wholeheartedly believed in the yet-to-be-seen utility of the airplane. Earlier, when he was using Huffman Prairie as an airfield, a piece of land littered with troublesome bumps, he insisted that they not flatten the terrain, believing that a useful flying machine should be able to take off and land, even on non-ideal terrain. Similarly, before flying over New York Harbor, crowded with ships for the event, he was asked if he thought it would be perilous to use the flying machine over so many obstacles. Wilbur's response was the same. What good is an airplane if it cannot fly anywhere? During that demonstration in New York, Wilbur flew over the Hudson, circled the Statue of Liberty, passed over the great ocean liner Lusitania as she departed for Europe, and was saluted by battleships. An estimated one million people watched Wilbur Wright and his flying machine that day. When asked later in an interview about an explosion heard from the engine, Wilbur dismissed it as an incident, and instead focused on the future of aviation, which he envisioned as high flying above the disturbed air at low altitudes. Once again, Wilbur Wright's vision was correct. The development of aviation, though, would continue beyond the Wright brothers. In 1909, Augustus Herring, an aviation enthusiast, worked with Glenn Curtis to form the Herring Curtis Company. This company would provide a new concept that would bring the flying machine one step closer to the airplane of today, the aileron. As opposed to the Wright's signature wing warping mechanisms, an aileron is a small, hinged flap on the trailing edge of a wing which can move to increase or decrease lift, thus allowing the aircraft to bank, depending on the position of each aileron. Only a few years later, World War I broke out, and the less conventional minds of the military believed they saw a military application for the flying machine. Before aviation would meet its true potential, it would have to undergo a rough growing phase during a world war.